Good morning, Holy Trinity Church. Wow, that was still not great, but better. Um, happy Sunday. Welcome to church this morning. Um, if you, by chance, stumbled in here because you were watching the marathon and you needed to find a place to use the restroom and you made your way into a church, uh, we're, really, we're really glad you're here. Um, if you're a, a, a runner, maybe, who accidentally stumbled uh, into our gathering this morning because maybe you also needed to use the restroom or get some coffee, uh, I just want to speak these words of truth from God's word over you. Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? So uh, sorry if you, if you didn't win this Sunday, but we're grateful to have you here in church. Um, and also shout out to all our congregants and family members who are actually running in the marathon this year. Um, it's an incredible thing, super inspiring. We did our obligatory two minutes of like, you know, go runners out on State Street. So it's a really cool thing. Um, but hopefully you got here okay. In all seriousness, uh, welcome to church. Welcome to church. Uh, maybe a, a reminder I want to give to you this morning is you're not just in a church space. Uh, and I know it maybe doesn't feel like a church space here in this, you know, office type building. Uh, you're not just in a church, you're with the church this morning. You're with the church. Uh, and I also want to remind you that you're forming, as we gather together on Sundays, you're forming the body of Christ. All right, so you're with the church. You're forming the body of Christ. I want to remind you that when we gather on Sunday mornings here together, we are declaring the hope of the world, all right? So you're with the church, you're forming the body of Christ, you're declaring the hope of the world. And maybe more importantly, I wanna remind you for a moment here of, of why we gather by telling you a couple reasons why we don't gather and what we're not. Uh, the church of Christ is not a social club. We're not a political party. We're not just an intellectual exercise. We're not just an interesting idea. We're not just here to sing a couple of songs, hear a nice message and say, oh, that was really good and go home. We're here to be the church. We're here to be the people of God, to declare the story of God. That's why we gather on a Sunday morning. Um, and so maybe some of you have forgotten that as you were uh, driving or taking the train here to church. Maybe you just thought, man, I'm going to go hear a couple songs, nice message, and go home. You're, you're with the church. You're with the people of God. And that's an amazing and beautiful thing. I want to read for you a quote from uh, a pastor named Stanley Harawas. This is, what he, this is what he says the goal of the church is. Why don't you go ahead and stand as I read these words over you and we prepare to sing our first song. You, you were with the church, but if we, you know, talk about it as just a, a nice idea, a political party, a thing we do, that's a vision that's aiming way too low. It's way too low. Let's talk about the high vision, the high calling that we have as a church this morning. This is what Stanley Harawa says about the mission of the church. He says, God hasn't promised us safety, but he's promised the church participation in an adventure called Kingdom. That seems to me to be great news in a world that is literally dying of boredom. God has entrusted us, his church, with the best story in the world. With great ingenuity, sometimes we manage, with the aid of much theory, to make that story quite boring, he says. Theories about meaning are what you get when you forget that the church and Christians are embattled by subtle enemies who win easily by denying that any war exists. But, church, this is what he says, God knows what he's doing in this strange time between the times, and he's inviting us again to engage with the enemy of evil through the godly weapons of preaching, sacrament, and church. That's what we're here to do. You're with the people of God this morning. So let me pray, and we'll go ahead and sing our first song. God, thank you for allowing us to gather here as an assembly, uh, not just to trade ideas back and forth, not just to gather and meet with people who look like us, think like us, talk like us. God, help our vision to aim much higher for what we do here on Sunday mornings. We are here to declare the greatest story in the world. 
Thank you for inviting us into that, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's all sing together.
pray with me. Father, we thank you that we can gather today as your church in this place, and we can declare that you have died and we are forgiven, that you have been raised, you are alive, and we are the risen. Lord, we thank you that we can declare Jesus Christ as our king today over the city, uh, in this place, and in our lives. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Well, now is the time in our service that we affirm the words of the Apostles' Creed. This is an ancient creed that's been said by Christians across the centuries and around the world. Uh, some of you might be on a spiritual journey and you're not sure what you believe right now. We are so glad that you're here. We invite you to listen, consider the claims of the Christian faith, and join your voice when you're able. But for those of you who are ready now, would you affirm these words with me? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Before we take our seats, say hello to your neighbor, introduce yourself, maybe tell them your um, adventure getting here this morning through the marathon traffic.
good morning, everybody. You can be seated. Good morning. Hi. <laughs> I hope you had some good adventure stories this morning. But guess what? We could breathe because you made it. We made it. And welcome to church this morning. But first, I have to give a shout out, even though they're not here, they're running right now, to members who are running the HTC Marathon. So Ted Linghu and Matt and Annie Hussey. So if you see them later, just send them a text, encourage them. We're so proud. Um, and hope they're running okay right now. Um, but welcome, welcome to HTC. If you're new here, my name is Jesse. I'm on staff. And it would be an honor to meet you. And so at the back, if this is your first time visiting, or maybe you've been attending for a while and you're looking to get plugged in, this announcement is for you. At the back is a welcome table. There you can find a gift, and then you can scan a QR code or fill out an iPad and get plugged in or let one of us follow up with you. We would love to know you more. It would be an honor for me to get coffee with you. And so fill out the Get Connected form. We'd love to meet you. Um, but I have a couple announcements for us. First, we know we have our HTC Institute cohorts, and the deadline to apply for those is Monday, the 10th. And I really want to put a plug in for this. If you're looking just to invest in a training program um, as an emerging leader, looking to maybe be in full-time ministry one day, or plan a church, or maybe just grow in Christian work, apply for the Chicago plan. But if you're new on this spiritual journey, or maybe you've been walking with God for 40 years, I wanna challenge all of you, all of you, to apply for our newest cohort, Life in the Family of God. I think this is a really unique opportunity to continue to be discipled and what it looks like to have conversations around sexuality and being the family of God. We all need to grow in knowing God and seeing how he can be glorified in us and also honoring the image bearer. And so this is a great opportunity for us all to continue in our discipleship, to grow and to love each other and just to worship the Lord. And so please apply for that. The deadline is tomorrow. All right, last announcement, and this is for all the members. Next Sunday, next Sunday, we have a congregational meeting right after church. And this is here in person. We're gonna be voting on some new deacons. And so please stay around and attend the meeting and let's vote um, and see some more laborers raised up. All right, so right now I'm gonna introduce Melissa. And I really wanna hear you guys get hype for David and Carrie, our new family members. And she's gonna introduce them for us. <laughs> Well, yes, we are so thrilled to, um, to welcome David and Carrie Engstrom. Uh, because of a few um, generous grants that we've received recently, we've been able to bring David Engstrom on our staff as our pastoral resident to oversee youth ministry. Uh, David and Carrie are getting settled in just in the last couple weeks here. Um, and yeah, we're just so excited to have them. So we want to make sure we give them a big welcome and just uh, wanted to learn a little bit more about them. So um, we'd love if you guys would just share a little bit about yourselves, where you're moving from, how long you've been married. Yeah, um, hi, no, it's so good to, to be here. Um, but yeah, we have been in uh, the north suburbs the past few years is where we've been living. Um, we've been studying at uh, Trinity in seminary there. And so we met in college at Trinity, and been married about three years now, um, and are really excited. We just moved to Wicker Park here in the city. So, <laughs> um, and yeah, really, really excited to be here. Yeah, awesome, and Carrie is gonna be. Oh, yeah. Um, and his ministry efforts, and then a little bit about me is I'm a human resources admin at a small pharmaceutical company back up in the uh, suburbs. And then uh, David and I are just really thrilled to be a part of HTC. Um, I'm so thrilled. Um, so many people already know who my name and who I am, and so I'm reading me this morning, and I was in here last week, so that was really special. Of course, so many people already know who I was, so. Um, yeah, thank you for your warm welcome, and David and I also really love coffee, so you wanna grab coffee sometime? <laughs> We would go with you. 
Excellent. Yeah. yeah, wonderful. David, would you just um, share? I know you've jumped in already. You're going to be overseeing our youth ministry. Would love just to hear a little bit about what you're excited for, what's ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely love youth ministry. Um, I am just thrilled by the opportunity to share the gospel and connect the gospel with life and um, the, the pressing need that exists to do that with students. And so I'm really excited to be stepping into this role. I'm really excited about... Um, the students and volunteers that I've already been able to meet at this church and just see um, the, the really good opportunity and, and connections that already exist. So I'm just thrilled and thankful to be stepping into this role and excited to see what the Lord will do in the future. Awesome. Well, yeah, we'd ask you to give a, a warm welcome to David and Carrie when you see them after. Yeah, thank you. We're, we're so encouraged already to have David as part of our staff team and to get to know Carrie as well. Um, and so would you just join me in praying for them? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for David and Carrie. We thank you for bringing them to Holy Trinity for this time. Lord, thank you what you've already done in their lives, how you've prepared them for this work. We lift them up to you. We pray that you would bless the work of their hands, that they would find joy in their work in the city. Lord, would you bless their marriage? Uh, Lord, would you bless their neighbors and, uh, and give them good opportunity to be a witness for you? We pray for David as he give leader, gives leadership to the youth ministry. Would you use him in the lives of these students? Would they learn not only by his teaching, but through his life as well? We ask that as he leads, you would also grow him, that he would be sharpened and encouraged by the students and by the whole HTC family. Lord, we pray for each one here this week, for those who are struggling through illness, those who struggle with hope, with relationships, and their work. Father, lavish your love and mercy on us and use the body of Christ to hold us up. For those who are celebrating, Lord, would you allow us to celebrate too and rejoice with our brothers and sisters as we do in the family of God. Father, use us this week to love and serve our neighbors and to bear witness to your kingdom and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray now for the service for the rest of the morning. We pray for Christian as he brings us your word. Lord, would you speak through him to us? We pray all of this in your son. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Would you please stand and sing with us? And it's at this point that the kids are dismissed for Kid City.
please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Our scripture reading today is taken from the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 15, verses 35 through 49. Again, that's 1 Corinthians 15, 35 through 49. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? You foolish person, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for humans, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind, and the glory of the earthly is of another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for star differs from star in glory. So is it with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is the first, but the natural, and then the spiritual. The first man was from earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Thanks, Devin, for that reading. If you are the fan of the Karate Kid, the original one, and Cobra Kai, you know that you don't mess with honor. You mess with honor of Daniel LaRusso's family or Mr. Miyagi, his sensei, you'll unleash Daniel San's inner strength. The lessons that, that Daniel learned throughout his training was that belief was really important. It was more than the bullies in his life. It's more than just being tough so that no one will mess with you. It was about what's inside. Your core beliefs. When those things were in place, Daniel could not be stopped. Perspective and mindset are two powerful forces that shape our lives. They are foundational to how we see things, how we interpret things, and how our moods are going to be. It's amazing what our perspectives and mindset can do. Carol Dweck, a renowned psychologist, wrote in her book, Mindset, the view you adopt for yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your life. It can determine whether you become the person you want to be and whether you accomplish the things that you value. How does this happen? How can a simple belief have the power to transform your psychology and, as a result, your life? In other words, what we believe greatly affects what we do. What we believe greatly affects what we do. The Corinthian church didn't believe that there would be a bodily resurrection. So how can we look forward to the resurrection? This is the, the answer that this passage is hopefully going to answer for us. In our passage, we're going to find out the answer framed around the, the question of the Corinthians. Uh, we'll see the question and Verse 35, we'll see the answer in verses 36 through 37. And then we'll see the answer framed out in a couple of ways. There's a, one explanation that God creates. We're going to look at 31 through 40, 38 through 41. And then the second explanation that God resurrects. 
and 42 through 44, and then we're going to see a case study at the end, 45 through 49. So let's pray together. Father, we just thank you so much for gathering us all here again on this morning. And, and Lord, as we open up your word, as we look at the foundations of the gospel, Father, I pray that you would open our, our eyes and our minds and our hearts to you. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us look at the first verse to look at the question. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? This whole passage begins with a couple of questions. But we could also ask, what is at the bottom of these questions? Are they genuine questions? Or are they questions that reveal doubt and disbelief? I don't think Paul heard this question explicitly out loud in person, but we can deduce that these questions would be asked with all the things that have been going on in the, the Corinthian church. So he rightly anticipated these types of question. This is what, what I would call Paul's FAQ. You know, FAQs are frequently asked questions, but also anticipated questions. I'm sure a lot of you asked, how do I get parking for the garage? You know, be, before we started worshiping here, you know, that was, that was on our FAQ, not because people said, how do we get parking? It's because we anticipated that people are going to be confused about how to find parking. So we put that in our FAQ. And we see this going on here, that Paul anticipated this question. These questions, though, stem out of their denial of the resurrection of the dead, as was preached last week. Verses 12 to 13 said, Now if Christ is proclaimed as from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. Paul addresses these doubts head on because this whole chapter deals with the main theological issue that the Corinthian church has wrong. All the other things are more moral or ethical, that you can make an argument that they got wrong because of this theological stance. Paul just made an argument that the dead will be raised, and how believing the resurrection of the dead is essential to believing that Christ has been raised. This is essential to believe because Christ's resurrection means that he has tri triumphed over sin and death. The resurrection is foundational to our faith, to the church. It is foundational to all we believe. Without it, all that you've built up is a house of cards. The gentlest breeze will knock it over. This chapter deals with a theological issue that the Corinthians are dealing with. If you can get this theological issue correct, all else will fall into place. Without resurrection, sin has won. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the body. But the body will be resurrected. Treat it with honor. If you understand this theological issue, you will be more loving. If you understand this, your sexual ethics will fall into place and in how you treat your body. You will know why it's important to think about the people around you and the whole body of Christ in worship and in marriage. If you can deal with this primary issue, dealing with the secondary issues will fall into place. If you remember Pastor John's preaching a couple of weeks ago, put, the, put first things first and you will get the second things. Put second things first and you will lose them both. This is foundational to who we are. Now let's look at Paul's answer, verses 36 through 37. It starts out, you foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or some other grain. Paul's response sounds pretty harsh. But let me picture it this way. For all of you who have moved, and you've had that very lopsided piece of furniture, you know what I'm talking about, those, those desks with all the drawers on one side, and then you just have this, this table on top, and it's still heavy, so you need a, another person to help you move it, right? And then you're, you're going up the stairs, but you are the unlucky one to get the side with the drawers, right? And so you're walking up a couple flights of stairs, and the other guy's like carrying, carrying up the light part. And after it's done, you put it down, and your friend says, well, that wasn't so bad. 
in your mind, you're thinking, you fool. I was carrying like 95% of the weight. Or, or to put it in more perspective, I just have to say, I drove into church this morning. And right away, you say, you're a fool. You should have taken the L. <laughs> you know, so, so th there's this example of Paul just saying, there is a resurrection from the dead. What are you asking, you fool? Paul puts them in their place by saying that. Their disbelief in the bodily resurrection stemmed from the thought that once they accepted Christ, that their physical, physical bodies were no more substance, that they were, had already entered into the spiritual realms. They had a misunderstanding of the spiritual realm. They wanted to skip this world and dive right into the spiritual. Perhaps that's why they put so much weight in speaking tongues as their spiritual gift, because we know that this was a tongue of angels in uh, chapter 13, 1. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, it declared mysteries of the Spirit in 14, 2. The Corinthian church wanted to launch themselves into this spiritual realm. This is the theology that Paul was correcting. What you do on this earth around you has great value for our, the argument against that. What you do on this earth with those around you has great value. They gave themselves too much credit for their own spiritual beings, but we see here that they are just a bare kernel of wheat or some other grain. There's nothing spectacular about wheat or some other the grain. It's very common. You know, I just... Uh, spread some grass seed in, in our yard to fill in some dead patches. You know, we ha do have some greenery around our home. And you know what? I can confirm that seeds are very boring. They're just tiny, and they spread them. It's very common. So as boring as that illustration was, this is what Paul's highlighting in these bear kernels, you're just a bear kernel. Paul told the Corinthian church, you're the same. You are a bear kernel. You are thinking too highly of yourselves when you're thinking of yourselves in the spiritual realm. You are not yet there. In the natural order of things, death comes before life can be given to it. You can't make that jump now. So Paul wants to reframe their question to not show doubt, but maybe if they could reframe it to show hope. Instead, let, let's try to frame this question in a positive way. How can you look forward to the resurrection? How can you anticipate the coming of the Lord? We can look forward to the resurrection, resurrection with hope that our resurrected bodies will be with Christ Jesus forever in our salvation. Paul explains it in two ways. We are reminded that, that God creates. We're going to look at uh, explanation one here in verses 38 through 41. In God's great creativity and intimacy in creation, he has created each body for purpose. The first section gives us an explanation to illustrate something simple, something that the Corinthians would understand the next section moves up to something a little less understandable in the second explanation. Paul moves up this ladder of abstraction in his explanations. The simple concepts were explained before the harder ones. To the Corinthians, what was the most basic thing that they understood? I think it was creation. That is where this passage takes us. The ladder of abstraction takes us through creation, I believe in reverse order, but he is highlighting the creator, God, in his first, first explanation, verse 38, but God gives it a body as he has chosen, and to each kind of seed its own body. God as a creator is also the designer. We have sown the seed of our body, and that's it. Remember that what Paul just said before, our body must die in, in, in the natural order of things. That's it. We will not see the resurrected body until our physical bodies are no more. And our literal, literal work in creating our spiritual bodies is very basic, down to a seed compared to God. As with different seeds, what is grown from a seed looks vastly different 
from the seed. Unless you're a botanist or a serious enthusiast in botany, you're most likely not going to tell the different seeds from each other. <clears throat> I just know what a grass seed looks like. But God created each body in special uniqueness. When we think about it, we should be left in awe of God's created order when we look at the days of creation. Each day was distinct and unique. Each body that God created is as unique as the days of creation. Verse 39 says this, For not all flesh is the same, but there is one kind for human, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. On the sixth day, God created humans. Thank you. <laughs> On the sixth day, God created humans. In Genesis 1, we look at verse 26 of Genesis 1. Then God said, make us, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Day six. On day five, God created animals and the flesh of the birds and another for fish. And God said in 24, and God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds, and it was so. And God said, let the water swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. The last two days of creation are probably what makes the most sense to us. These are tangible. On the ladder of abstraction, this is the most concrete. You can see me. I can see you. We, we could look and see the people next to us. We could say hi, give a handshake to them. We could feel our hands. We could relate with people. Then the animals, those with pets at home, we know what animals are. We can touch them and see them. For Chicagoans, we know what gigantic rats look like. And then it goes the same with birds. There's a familiarity with them. It doesn't take much to see the creation of everything on the earth. Paul painted the picture of the obvious. The Corinthian church needed this reminder. Continuing in Corinthians in verse 40, there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is of one kind and the glory of the earthly is of another. Paul continues to explain the diversity of God's creation. There's a break in the order of creation to move up another rung in this ladder of abstraction. Humans, animals, fish, and birds on the most observable, the earthly bodies. Then there are the heavenly bodies of things in the skies, which are, um, which are observable but far less easy to follow. There's a cosmic element to it. The anthropological aspect of the body of the earth is easier to grasp than the astrophysical element of the heavenly bodies. God is the creator of all. There are a lot of unknowns in space, at least to me. You know, I, and I can't even imagine what it was like back in the biblical times when they didn't have telescopes. They couldn't see out there. So this was like, wow, this is amazing what's out there. So they, it was in the realm of not really understanding. You know, I've known Pluto most of my life to be a planet. But just back in 2006, it was called the dwarf planet. I don't know what that is, but it's not a planet anymore. But there are still things that we're discovering about what's out there. God created each heavenly body in their uniqueness and function, their glory. There are distinct glories and splendor in each part of creation. The heavenly bodies, those things up in the sky, and the earthly bodies, those on the earth. 
Continuing in verse 41, there is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star and glory. On the fourth day, God created the sun, the moon, and the stars in chapter 1 of verse 14 in Genesis. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years and let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth and it was so and God made the two great lights the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars and God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth we are now connected with the vastness of God's creation this is beyond our reach this is a reminder of our God, creator. He's created everything for glory. Look at the works of God. Look and be amazed. Observe and you will know. You know, lately, Noah, our, our five-year-old, has been learning about the monarch butterfly in his classroom, and it's pretty awesome. And they get to see it with their very own eyes. They have these little aquarium, <clears throat> excuse me, they have these little aquariums with caterpillars that cocoon and turn into a chrysalis. And yeah, I learned chrysalis from my five-year-old. And, and when they turn later, they will turn into a butterfly. We've known that caterpillars turn into butterflies forever. Ever since we can remember, we know caterpillars turn into butterflies. But when you really think about the transformation it's pretty amazing. And sometimes you just have to look through the eyes of a child, in our case, the eyes of a five-year-old, to be amazed at what God has done. So how can you look forward to the resurrection? How can you anticipate the coming of the Lord? We can look forward to the resurrection with hope that our resurrected bodies will be with Christ Jesus forever in our salvation. Because God is our creator. But not only does God display his power in creation, but God also resurrects. If we look in verses 42 through 44, it says this, So it is with resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. These verses continue up that ladder of abstraction. The, the dichotomy is clear. There's a distinction between us and God. Just as God created the world out of nothing, God will resurrect your bodies that are prone to death. We are, we are taken back to the, to the seeds and sowing language in the beginning of the passage in verses 36 and 37 and, and brings us to the other side of the what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. What you sow, when you sow a seed, it needs to die in the ground in order for the plant to grow. Our earthly bodies are perishable. But God will raise it imperishable. God will raise us in what will never perish or die. Our bodies are sown in dishonor, tainted with sin, muck and mire, dishonoring to God. But God has raised it in glory beyond the moon, the sun, and the stars. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Our bodies are weak as they will die. But God will raise our bodies in power. God was almighty and powerful when he created the, world, the earth and the world. I believe that the Corinthians knew that God had created everything, but they didn't apply that truth to him to be able to raise us or raise them in power. They lost sight of the creator God. God is beyond the created order. He has power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there's also a spiritual body. We are pointed to that, the spiritual body. None of us can even begin to imagine what the world was before the world was. You can think and think and think about it, but you won't have a good answer. 
The Corinthians were living in this natural, physical world, thinking that they were in the spiritual world, thinking that their physical bodies would just die and they could just live in this dreamland of spirituality. However, they are in the natural, physical world, but God will take them into the spiritual world when they're with their resurrected physical bodies. This actually takes us back, I believe, to Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And if our theology is right, we know that Christ was in that creation narrative. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, he Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. To me, that's pretty amazing. There's so many things going on here. So how can you look forward to the resurrection? How can you anticipate the coming of the Lord? We can look forward to the resurrection with hope that our resurrected bodies will be with Christ Jesus forever in our salvation because God creates, because God resurrects, and now illustrated in this case study at 45 through 49. Thus, it is written in verse 45, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural. And then the spiritual. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven, as a man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Paul's explanations are illustrated in this final example of the first man, Adam, and the last Adam, which is Christ. Paul makes a distinction between Adam and Christ, mainly that Adam represents man and the, the human of the natural world. The first Adam became a living being. Genesis 2.7 tells us that the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and then man became a living being. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, became a life-giving spirit, this is a natural order of things. The natural things happen for us. The natural must die before the spiritual. We are like Adam. Adam came from dust and returned to dust. Sin came through Adam, and we inherited that sin. So we, like Adam, are broken. And we have inherited all things physical that Adam inherited. The first Adam was not spiritual, but natural. The first Adam was a man of dust from the ground. We are the dust of the ground. We are natural beings. There's an image of humility here. The Corinthians were of Adam, of dust, earthly, natural, mortal, humble, broken. But, it's a big but here. Verse 49 says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Of Christ. Christ is spiritual. Christ is from heaven. But he came to earth and returned to heaven. He is of heaven, and we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. This is exciting news. The gospel that the Corinthian church was in danger of believing. They were in danger of believing the half-hearted gospel. They believed in the resurrected Lord, but that's where their understanding stopped. There were some that didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. There were some that didn't believe in the resurrected body. There were some that didn't believe that their bodies would be resurrected. Holding on to those beliefs implicitly denied the resurrection of Christ. That belief keeps Christ, in a sense, in the grave where a hope would lie if there is no resurrection. So now you see that this theological issue was a foundational one for the Corinthians. Without this theological foundation, everything that Paul taught them would make no sense in how or why they should build up the church. 
Adam represents a natural body. Christ represents a spiritual body that resurrected from the natural body. In the timeline of creation and man, our bodies inherited in Adam's natural state, which is perishable and will die, but our bodies will also inherit in the future Christ resurrected state, which is eternal, the new creation. Christ perfectly represented this for us. As the first Adam, he died. As a second Adam, second Adam, he rose again from the dead and now lives eternally in his physical and spiritual body. This brings us great hope. So how can you look forward to the resurrection? How can you anticipate the coming of the Lord? We can look forward to the resurrection with hope that our resurrected bodies will be with Christ, Jesus, forever in our salvation. This will drastically, knowing this truth, this will drastically affect how we live our days. The full gospel is truth that we can rely on. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, suffered on the cross to die so that we wouldn't have to. He also rose to life to erase what Adam brought into the earth to give us hope that the bodies we live in now are going to be made perfect. This is hope that we can depend on. So in this physical world, live in a way that looks forward to our bodies being resurrected, keeping our uniqueness that God has given to us, but restored from being broken down by sin. And the glory of spending eternity with Christ will be incredible. Let's live in that anticipation and get excited together. Perhaps, perhaps you're in the Corinthian seat thinking that there is no resurrection. I want to direct you and your attention back to 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 6. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the world, I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Christ resurrected. He has risen. He is alive. Knowing this changes everything. All of these things that Paul has written in the first 14 chapters tells us that how we live on earth matters. Flee sin. Flee sexual immorality. Be comfortable in the body that God has blessed you with. Love others more than yourselves. Be the church. Live in a more excellent way. You know, I I just have one simple explanation or application. Live in hope by looking at the resurrected Christ. Live in hope by looking at the resurrected Christ. Let that hope shape how you live. Let that hope shape how you treat your body. Let that hope shape how you avoid sin. Let that hope shape how you treat others, believing that Christ rose again from the dead for our salvation should bring us great hope. We can look forward to the resurrection and hope that we will be with Christ forever in our salvation. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for giving us great hope by sending your son Jesus Christ to die to sin but rise again from the dead I pray that this hope will be clear in everyone heart, everyone's heart today and for those who do not know this hope I pray O oh Lord that they put their sights on Jesus Christ who from the very beginning had the power to create and is seated in the heavenly realms and in your name we pray Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
is our hope in life and death. Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes upon Hope springs eternal, Christ our hope in life and death. The, the benediction comes from 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with all who look forward to the resurrection with hope that we will be with Jesus Christ forever in our salvation. Amen. Thank you. 